Hello and welcome to the Fear Free Pet Behavior Symposium hosted by the San Francisco SPCA. Thanks for joining us today and please give a warm welcome to Heidi Royce Lamke. I am honored to be part of such an esteemed group of speakers, very knowledgeable in behavior and these fear-free techniques, and I'm very excited to be here today. I am at uh, Oakland Vet Referral Services, and I'm very lucky to work with Dr. Teresa Porter, who's a board-certified behaviorist, and working to get our facility here free. So I'm really happy to share with you personal experience on working in a surgical and emergency care environment. My conflict of interest, you know, any nerd's going to have their dabblers and their toys, and these are a lot of the products that I either test for companies or have. I really don't think any of these will impact my presentation today. I am on the Fear Free Speakers Bureau and really happy to be here with you guys today. So let's get started. So how many of you have heard about Bramble's Five Freedoms? Um, Bramble's Five Freedoms have been around for a really long time. Um, in the UK in the 1960s, they came up with some key points on what we should do when raising livestock. And they decided that it would be really important for these animals to not have to suffer from being hungry or thirsty. They also thought it would be important to make sure these animals are comfortable at all times. And if for some reason they did get sick or get injured, that we identify and treat those conditions as promptly as possible. Another key point for the livestock was that they allowed to be able to express normal behaviors. So if they're a herd animal, they should be allowed to hang out with other species of their kinds and herds, and they should be able to do all of the things that they would do out in the natural world. And then it, the last thing they established was that these animals should be protected from having fear and distress. So these were really the early foundations of the fear-free movement. And I know when this movie came out in uh, 2017, there was a huge uproar with the news and people being horrified that they were taking this German shepherd and pushing it into this churning water. And the dog was actually experiencing a lot of fear and Dr. Becker uh, tells his story sometimes. And, you know, if anybody came into your clinic, and maybe this sounds familiar to you, maybe you're doing a nail trim on a dog that is pooping and peeing and struggling and foaming at the mouth and expressing its anal glands and looks purple and maybe even bleeding because it chewed on its tongue. You know, these animals are acting the way they're acting because they're afraid they're going to die. So animals don't just come into your clinic saying, you know what, I'm gonna ruin her day today. They don't do that. And so the way that I like to look at Fear Free is if every animal that comes into my clinic could fill out a survey, what if they could fill out a survey and rank your clinic, you know, five stars, meaning that they loved it there, they can't wait to come back, they wanna tell all of their friends to come in, or a one, meaning you sucked, it was terrible, and they never wanna go back there again. And so I do strive for perfection. Do I get fives on every one of my surveys? Probably not, but do I try? Yes, I do. And for me, you know, like Teresa DePorter said, learning to read body language, it's just like doing anesthesia. You start looking for those subtle signs. And anyone who knows me, they know that I'm loud and I make big gestures and I move quickly and I talk fast. And so when you're going to learn to be fear free around some of these animals, you're going to need to learn to be quiet and move slow and have a calmer demeanor. And if I can do it, I know that you guys can do it too. So what is fear free veterinary practice? You know, it's basically being cognizant of the emotional and behavioral well-being of these animals. 
I think for years and years, we've done such a great job of taking care of their bodies and their physical ailments, but we've really left the emotional and psychological part of this puzzle way behind. And so I'm so happy that this is finally getting to be so embraced and so popular um, because we really want to alleviate the fear, anxiety, and stress associated with these veterinary visits to increase compliance and um, gentle handling and behavior of these animals. We're going to be able to do a much better job when the animal you know, imagine if you wanted to draw blood and then you just hold the animal's foot, they hold it out, you draw the blood. Imagine a world where you could take an x-ray where you want to put the animal on the table, you lay them on their side, they lay there politely, the x-ray gets done, there's no struggling or anything. I mean, this is where we're going. And it's such an exciting new world, an exciting new way. Um, and it's going to improve safety for everyone in the practice, in all areas of the practice. And so the fear-free certification, which I highly recommend all of you per, uh, pursue if you haven't, is to reduce or remove those triggers that cause anxiety, no matter where they're at. You know, anxiety can start at home. Um, during the transportation process, the vet office, it goes on and on and on. But the goal with our pet owners is to teach them to bring these calmer animals to the vets so that we can also work to create a fear, anxiety, and stress-free environment in the hospital and also to learn how to handle these animals in a respectful and gentle way. And what happens here? So you're going to get better quality of medicine. You know, imagine never getting bit again, never getting scratched again. You know, it opens, again, a whole new world. And if animals want to be there and they're happy to see you, then if that animal needs to come back, you know, 10 days for a suture removal, four weeks for x-rays, eight weeks for more x-rays, then the owners are going to be more compliant because their animal is going to be easy to get into the car and going to be cooperative when it gets into the clinic. Once you, your clinic becomes known as the only clinic that can cut your dog's toenails, these clients are going to be bonded to your practice for life. And everyone will have a lot greater job satisfaction and happy clients and happy pots in it, it really is a win-win situation. So um, this is what it looks like. Here you can see this little dog is getting a bandage change. And this little dog doesn't care anything about getting the bandage change. This little puppy is so happy to be licking this frozen chicken broth that he could care less what's going on with the bandage. And so when a calm animal comes in, we're going to get more accurate vitals. We're going to be utilizing a lot less sedation. And I know many of us are familiar with stress colitis, vomiting and diarrhea, just because you're getting so ramped up. And this is going to result in you know calmer animals and less of those undesirable. Uh, side effects. And you know what? We have people like Martha Stewart to blame for the fear free movement because she isn't going to take her little Frenchies to the vet unless they're running to the front door and they want to go in there. And so the millennials and all of the younger people whose pets are now, you know, members of the family, they may be pushing off childbearing, then these pet owners are going to want care that is comparable to what they they get and they're going to want their animals to have a great time there which means we're going to have to find out what these animals like and make sure that they find it rewarding and so most of these fear free visits are going to involve lots and lots and lots of treats and so learning to read body language is fundamental into understanding how to provide a fear-free experience for a veterinary patient. And in my practice, we do predominantly see dogs and cats. And so if you can look at the dog in the left and the dog in the right and see the different expressions when a dog on the left is more relaxed versus the dog in the right is a lot more stressed. 
And these images are available. There are some of the fear-free resources that you can get. But when we're talking about reading body language, we're going to be looking at the face in particular. We're going to look at the eyes. A calm dog will have almond-shaped eyes and normal-sized pupils. We're going to be looking at the ears, and a calm dog will have, you know, neutral ears that are not flattened. We're going to be looking at the spine or the posture of the animal, and a calm animal will have a flexible neck and tail. And then we're going to be looking at the tail as well as the mouth and what is the mouth doing. And so our stressed friend on the right, you can see that, you know, the dog gets more of a wrinkled brow, the pupils can get dilated. Some people describe a whale eye. The ears can be um, outside or flat against the head. The spine um, will be very rigid or stiff. The tail might be like really above the top line or it can be tucked right under. And then the mouth is gonna be closed, but the lips will look really tense. And so when we look at the same signs in our feline friends, we're going to be focusing on these same body areas. But you can see our stressed cat on the front, on the right is going to have the dilated pupils. Um, the ears will be out to the side or back against the head. The spine will typically be arched. Uh, the tail might be tucked all around the body. It might be thumping, and we all recognize these. If you've been working in the veterinary field for any period of time, you know, you can tell an angry cat, I think, much easier than you can tell a frightened dog. And so when we're learning about fear free, we need to learn some of the new terminology. And FAS, you'll hear, stands for fear, anxiety, and stress. We'll be talking briefly about the emotional medical records or the EMRs, and we'll be talking a little bit about pre-visit pharmaceuticals. And I know a lot of my colleagues will have a lot more information to share on this topic in the upcoming lectures. Now, what's nice about the fear, anxiety, and stress scale is it's set up a lot like a traffic light. And I know there's a lot of words on this slide, but I, what I want you to realize is that learning to read body language and learning to interpret these different levels of fear, anxiety, and stress is going to take some practice. But when you're just learning like I am, you know, green means go. And these are going to be animals that are very relaxed, very happy to be there, readily taking treats. When you get into the yellow stage, these are going to be animals that are getting a little nervous about the environment. Maybe they don't want to play with the toy. Maybe they're a little bit fidgety or difficulty settling. And these animals would likely benefit from some pre-visit pharmaceuticals or other techniques. And then the red zone, the stop zone. These are animals that, again, are afraid for their lives. You know, they think they're going to die. And that is why they will, you know, freeze or, or flight. And we know that fear is acquired um, in many different ways. Sometimes it's from genetics. Sometimes it's from stress during pregnancy. The mother was stressed. Uh, sometimes it can be the maternal behavior. So a fearful mother can uh, have fearful puppies. Sometimes certainly it can be a lack of socialization or certainly it can be the result of bad experiences. But the stop zone, these are going to be animals that have little or no interest in uh, what's going on. They're not gonna wanna play with the treats. They're going to be, you know, flight freeze or fight responses. And we're going to want to sedate these animals. And remember, we need to assess how these animals are coping in each area in the hospital. Can this dog have a comfortable experience in the lobby? You know, kind of be comfortable on the scale. Maybe they need to have their whole exam done out in the parking lot. But the carrier, the exam room, the during the exam itself, the procedures, the treatment room, boarding, um, hospitalization, all these different areas, we need to find out where are these animals the most comfortable? And if they're not, what can we do to make it better? Um, and so this picture here are, are some of the signs that we use at our clinic that we made to educate the rest of our staff. 
And in general, when you're working with these animals, for dogs, you get three seconds a try and three tries before you regroup, or what I like to say, go to plan B. And with cats, you know, you get two seconds and two tries. And so you make these attempts, and if it's not going well, then you go ahead and go to plan B. And so we're also gonna talk about considerate approach. So look at this cat here. What if I had to take this cat to radiology? What path through my hospital am I going to take to get this cat to radiology? What if I was forced to walk past a bank of barking dogs? That's gonna make this cat feel very unnerved and very uncomfortable. And so a considerate approach not only involves how do we move this patient in our environment with the least amount of stress, but look at this exam room on the right. You can see this is a typical exam room with a ceramic or tile floor that is very, very slippery for my orthopedic patients. I see cruciates all day long. And imagine having either a broken leg or a cruciate tear and having these on, you know, slippery surfaces. So this is where you're going to want to say, you know, for this room, I have owners come in the side door where the floor we have in the back is very textured, or we'll use area rugs, or we'll use a sling, or a harness, or some other ambulation aid to help this animal get from point A to point B without being afraid of walking on these textured surfaces. And then we're going to talk about general control. And we have people like Dr. Sophia Yin and Karen Overall that were really the very early pioneers in these types of handling techniques. But when we're talking about gentle control, your animal shouldn't you shouldn't make it feel like it's in a, a WWF video, right? Or a WWF event. And these are where, you know, you slam them down and you pin them down and you, you know, use things very roughly. For these animals, gentle control, what that means is that when you have to reposition this animal, maybe we have to put this dog in let her come and see. But let's do it in a way so that it's gentle and this animal's body feels like it's being supported the whole time as we slowly reposition it. So that may mean that you're going to need more than one person to help you reposition these animals so that they don't feel like they're in a WWF uh, event. And then this you know, little puppy on the right, you know, if you have to put an IV catheter and do a treatment, again, these are more of those chicken broth popsicles and these animals, it's really nice to use a, as a distraction. And then we're gonna talk about touch gradient. So if you get a dog in that has a flaming, painful ear infection, the first thing you're not gonna do is like head into the ear, right? You want to try to make friends with these animals and it may involve, you know, brushing or petting or just touching the animal in areas of its body that it's comfortable with so it can be comfortable with you getting more intimate and looking at those painful areas. And another technique we talk about is that we don't, you know, abruptly take our hands off and on these patients. So once you lay your hand on the patient, you're going to try to gently glide your hands around that animal's body while you're examining the different areas without a lot of abrupt off and ons that can be startling to some patients. And then and only then are you going to examine the area of discomfort once you have that animal's trust and they're feeling more relaxed. And so physical exams are really important. You know, certainly it's ideal to keep these pets with the owners if at all possible. These pets are going to be more comfortable with their pet owner. And then, you know, you have to think about what do you want and what do you need? So for me, if I'm going to be anesthetizing these animals, I need to get a listen to the heart and lungs because I need to have, you know, blood work drawn. I need to have good organ function. I need to have the kidney and liver working okay. I need to have good heart and lung function. Um, you know, and, and some states do have 
guidelines that say you must get a temperature on every patient. But you know, if you're in one of those states where you do have some flexibility, the animal's coming in for a routine vaccine. You know, yes, a, a temperature would be nice, but it it's not always uh, a, a need in in certain situations. So think about what you need and think about what you want and then work on the those two areas and, and get your needs in first and then when we're doing these physical exams this is juliana in one of my exam rooms and this is a patient that we were seeing um you know this little dog looks very comfortable so we really want to minimize fear anxiety and stress at all costs and to be honest the, the main reason a wild animal that is is trapped and drops that abruptly is because of massive catecholamine release. So catecholamines are not your friend in patient handling, certainly not at all in the preoperative or perioperative period. And so important factors for this is going to be controlling pain, which is, means we're gonna have to use some analgesics, we're going to have to sedate these animals early and not let them get to those high levels of fear, anxiety, and stress. And again, you're gonna to have to learn like me to be quiet and go slow and be calm. Um, and if again, if you can do it, or if I can do it, you can do it, I know you can. Uh, and then another important thing is sometimes, you know, you're working on a patient and it's just not working out. And, you know, I am not the clinic cat person in my clinic. I do have cats, but I am not the cat whisperer. And so there are going to be times where you're going to just not have it going well. And, and you say, I can't work with this animal. It doesn't like me for whatever reason. And bring in those, you know, Pied Pipers of the cat world or bring in those people that have those special talents that can make it nicer for those animals. It's okay to tap out. It's okay to tap out. And then use your pheromones. You know, I went into this one clinic where as soon as you walked in the door, they had this basket of tennis balls that were sprayed with the pheromones. And I thought that was great. Uh, pheromones, you know, have a 50-50 shot of helping, which is pretty good odds for everything but birth control in my book. Um, if they're really ramped up and have those higher levels of fear, anxiety, and stress, it's not going to work. But for, you know, um, Brittany and, and Bob, you know, you can put these pheromones for your cats. You you put the feel away right there and your chest area. And for your dog friends, you know, your lower body, you know, where they have quarter when they like to see you in the lower zone. And you repeat this a couple times a day. And then you can use your bandanas. So some clinics do put these pheromones on the bandanas and put those on the patients. There are those tennis balls I was telling you about. <clears throat> And then you use blankets, right? You can put feel away towels over these cats. You can put uh, adaptal in your dog wards and your bedding. The adaptal comes in a lot of different varieties, uh, collars, diffusers that cover 600 square feet and last a month. You've got your little spritzers uh, for cats. You got your wipes. So, you know, it's for your bedding blankets balls and bandanas go ahead and use these pheromones freely because they can really help in a lot of different ways and then we're going to talk about the emotional medical record so you have your regular record that's got all your vaccines your anesthetic records all of that the emotional medical record just talks about you know what is this animal like when it comes to see you where does it like to be examined does it prefer to be, you know, in the owner's lap, outside in the parking lot, on the floor, on the table? What is this patient like when it comes in? Would it rather have a toy, a squeaky toy that can completely change the frame of mind for some dogs? Um, treats, what treats does it like? And make sure the owner brings these animals in a little bit hungry and bring some of these special foods with them. And then some animals are more comfortable with their owner. Sometimes they're more comfortable away from the owner. So you have to figure all of these, these things out. And that's what's going to go in your emotional medical record. So fear free in a time crunch, you know, don't hesitate to sedate. Um, you know, in a perfect world, it would be great if we could have happy visits and 
and visits where animals just come in, go on the scale, get a treat, go home. But when we get into these situations where I like to call that ship has sailed, you know, with these wounds and broken legs, we don't really have time to do the whole desensitization period. And so we're going to need to intervene early with sedatives. And for these cases, the, like this dog right here, clearly there's a flag on the play, right? There's something very wrong with this dog's leg. And we could, you know, struggle with this animal, take five or six shots, get three or four people involved and make it miserable for this animal. Or we could just sedate it right off the bat, get some good quality x-rays right away, and then go ahead and, and cast or splint this dog's leg and do other things that make it feel good about being there. Because remember, you want fives on your survey. Now, also technicians, you know, I do talk to pet owners about fasting and when's a good time to fast. And if you look at these guidelines from Jaha, that's from 2011. And so maybe this sounds familiar to you. Maybe you say, no food after midnight, pick the water up in the morning when you get up. So some of these animals are coming in and they haven't eaten in a really long time. But the new guidelines say to withhold food for about three to six hours before surgery, water again until they're premedicated. Why do I say this? Why is this important? This is important because if you need to have that dog lick a little bit of that uh, frozen chicken broth, or if you need to give an animal a couple of pill packets to get them to take a medication, it's okay, we can use treat behaviors or treating before some of these procedures to help get these animals more comfortable and be happy to be there. Okay, how about um, perioperative nausea? There was a study and people were asked to rank, you know, if you were going to have a procedure, what are you worried about? Are you worried about being painful? Are you worried about dying? Are you worrying about having a myocardial infarction? Or are you worried about being nauseous? And what do you think people said when they were asked this before their procedure? And by the way, this is my my dad and my my dad's dog, Della. You know, they're they're members of the family. And surprisingly, nausea was the number one concern. And in fact, they did a study back in 2015. And they found out that 92% of pet owners were willing to pay, you know, roughly $30 and come in an hour early if they knew that their animal wouldn't vomit. And, you know, think about this. Think about if you had a fresh abdominal incision and then you're like, you know, I mean, I, I hate to vomit. And I can understand why people wouldn't want their pets to vomit. And it really didn't even matter, you know, your socioeconomic status or where in the world that you live. And for me as a veterinary nurse, I know that I have a lot of other important things that I can do, I need to do besides cleaning up vomit because that's, that's gross. All right, so let's talk about some pre-visit pharmaceuticals, some PVPs for dogs. And so there are certainly a lot of different drug classes that you can use. Uh, the benzos are popular, the, the, like um, Alprazolam or Lorazepam. Trazodone, at my clinic, we hand that stuff out like candy. You know, every orthopedic case gets a 100 count bottle of that stuff to take home. And because I, I'm expecting these pet owners to keep these animals quiet for the next, you know, eight to 12 weeks. You can certainly use ACE promazine in combination with other drugs is nice, but in and of itself, it's not anxiolytic and it's no longer considered good practice to give strictly ACE promazine to animals that are having fireworks phobias or thunderstorm phobias because it just makes them not be able to move and it doesn't do anything to get rid of that anxiety. Um, gabapentin for cats, you know, my cardiology service sees a lot of cats. Those cats get that the night before their appointment and, and morning of, and, you know, it's like game changer. You know, you can use Quantidine, you, you can use phenobarbital. And if you take a look at this little dog here, this little dog here is a little bit nervous. If you look carefully, you can see a little lip lick and it's looking away. It's not interested in me at all standing in front of its cage. 
And then there's other drugs too, you know, when things get a little higher intense for some of these animals, you can use a uh, cilio or you can actually shoot your dextomator right into the oral cavity, about a third of that will get absorbed. Um, opioids add, added into these can be very beneficial. And then there's the nutraceutical families like zilkine and tryptophan and melatonin. And you'll probably recognize if you're familiar with the chill protocols that a lot of these drugs are in chill protocols. So it's gonna be polypharmacy, different drugs mixed together to help make these animals feel relaxed. And so in this video, you're seeing Pearl. And if you look at Pearl, if you look at her thigh, you can see it's trembling really bad. And Pearl is also exhibiting a high amount of fear, anxiety, and stress. The pointing dog stance is very typical for these dogs. And you can see she's looking away. She doesn't want to be here. She doesn't, she's not interested in me and she just wants to get out of there and go home. Um, and then of course, pheromones. <clears throat> so I'm not saying that you need to buy all of these different drugs and have all of these different drugs at your disposal. But what I am saying is that get a couple in your toolbox, a couple that you're comfortable with, and they can be your main go-tos for your practice, like trazodone and gabapentin are at my practice. Our kitty friends, uh, PVPs are gonna be very similar. You know, you can certainly use trazodone in dogs, but I like gabapentin in cats. Um, it's roughly 50 to 100 milligrams of gabapentin per cat. You know, you're supposed to be able to open the capsule up and mix it in a little bit of canned food, and they're supposed to gobble it right down. So I'm not trying to overwhelm you with the options. I just want to let you know there are a lot of options. Um, you can also use oral ketamine. You know, you can take like one cc of ketamine and shoot that through a time cat catheter, and you can get that into these cats. Um, the buprenorphine works really well transmucosally in our kitty friends. The nutraceuticals are also an option here. Um, and then antiemetics, I'm gonna say antiemetics for both dogs and cats is going to be very, very important. You know, some cats, you put them in the, in the car and you put them in their crate and wanna take them for a ride and they're gonna be like meowing the whole time and possibly, you know, barfing and everything else in there. So whatever you can do to make it nice. Now I have this, video labeled as cool cats and i i personally like i wanted to reach into this cage and pet this cat because this cat looks like it's a very friendly cat but there is something very wrong with this cat and i want you to remember take a look closely at this cat's um ear distance take a look at this cat's whiskers and the shape of the muzzle and i think when we go further on you're going to uh, know exactly what's a bigger issue with this cat. Because for me, uh, learning to tell the difference between a painful animal and an animal that is having fear, anxiety, and stress is also going to be very important. So confinement can be stressful. In fact, at my facility, I do have some people that say their pet has never been away from home before. And these owners have a lot of anxiety wondering about how are these animals going to feel when they're in these uh, stressful environments. So PVPs, again, if you can have the pet owners, um, you know, the dogs get trazodone on the night before and morning off. When they get there in the morning, we also start the uh, gabapentin right away. Definitely 100%, you should keep separate dog and cat wards, ideally where the cats are in a quiet area and that they can't hear the barking dogs. And then schedule accordingly. Again, this makes sense to me. I don't teach rocket science. It would make sense to me that, you know, if you have some of these anxious animals, get them in the very last and then get them home as soon as you can. So what we'll do at our practice is we'll have the owners stay with these animals in the exam room. We'll, you know, pop them in the booty with some sedation. We'll let them marinate and get sleepy or turn into pancakes so they're flat out. The owner leaves, we take them right to surgery. We do the surgery and then they recover in a, in a run and they go home as soon as they can. 
And so these are all going to be key for helping some of these animals. So you're going to get fives on your survey. All right. So here is another dog that came into our practice. And this dog, if you look at this dog, you can see it is vi literally vibrating. I and mean, this dog is twitching. Every, every part of it, its uh, body is twitching. Let me try to get my video to play here again. So you can see the ears are twitching differently. The eyes are opening and closing. He's panting when he's not thirsty or hot. Very classic, high level fear, anxiety, and stress. This dog was just a bundle of nerves. So bringing familiar smells from home can help. Um, toys and blankets, non-slip floors can help. Um, soft, clean bedding, ideally from home. Those pheromones can help. Uh, cats might like, you know, silver vine or catnip. And certainly using low odor disinfectants um, I don't know about you, but sometimes I've been in the grocery store where someone with entirely too much cologne or perfume is right on my heels and I cannot move quickly enough to get into the next aisle. And this can happen to these animals, but what if they're in a kennel that is cleaned with rocal or bleach and, and they have these really strong odors and they can't go into the next aisle, they can't get a new room. And that's why a lot of these hydrogen peroxide based cleaners have become so, so popular. Another thing to remember is, you know, what procedure are we doing? Um, make sure we treat that pain. Make sure we don't exacerbate the discomfort these animals are in just by the surgical positioning. So if I have to stretch this animal out on the table, and it, this animal is a cat, you know, 90% of cats over time have osteoarthritis, I can anticipate that that animal is going to feel worse when it recovers. And then for anesthesia, let's make sure we always do a better job next time around which means we're going to refer to our prior records and try to do a better job and minimize any of the complications before. And so PVP is, you know, your trazodone, and your gabapentin, it works synergistically with a lot of the drugs I use for anesthesia. So there's no really contraindications for these unless the drug insert says that the animal has an underlying problem where it can't have that particular sedative. But let's remember analgesia. Let's try to lower the fear, anxiety, and stress. Let's, um, you know, the goals are to have smoother inductions and have more of these uh, induction doses left so we don't have to plow it all in just because we drew it up and then try to get away with lower vaporizer settings. And so morphine family drugs are going to be key for prevent preventing pain. They're so cheap. You know, there's not really a reason to not use them. We can find an opioid for every single surgical procedure, but let's make sure it mirrors the procedure, right? So if I'm gonna take some x-rays, maybe, you know, a little bit of etorphanol, would be fine. But if I'm going to cut your arm off, I am not going to expect you to be happy with just a dose of eutorphanol. You're going to need to use those pure mu opioids like morphine, fentanyl, methadone, and the like. Local anesthetics should be incorporated into any and every anesthetic protocol. I will tell you that any board certified anesthesiologist will tell you that every animal should have the benefit of an opioid, a local anesthetic, and an NSAID, as long as there's no contraindications. So we can use these amla creams topically over the catheter insertion site, the pivocaine, uh, specifically the noceta, lasts 72 hours or longer. We use it in almost every single surgery, dogs and cats. And you can see from this list all the different places you can put these blocks. There's really no excuse to not be doing them because you hold that bottle of local anesthetic. Whoa, angels sing. They block 100% of pain perception, something no other class of drugs can do. 
All right, Dextomator. Now these are for the cases where it's getting really difficult to handle these animals. And Dextomator does provide some analgesia. It does lower those cortisol levels and it does have a dose dependent sedation. So we're going to use this predominantly on these younger animals, ASA twos or threes. I think you can see uh, this friend here, this dog is wearing uh, an adaptal rag on the back of his neck. I don't think it's working. This dog is clearly uh, trying to bite us and is not having a delightful time. We're not getting fives on our survey from this animal, but when you start to heavily sedate these animals, be sure that you provide supplemental oxygen. And I am gonna have you guys uh, take a picture of this slide. This is an excellent resource, a video done by Melly Tong that talks about a sedation ninja. And for me, you know, you wanna be like rattlesnake fast with some of these IM injections. Ideally try to use the quadriceps if you can over the lumbar area. But in this video, you see uh, this aggressive dog walking along and the person has a syringe with some tubing and a needle. While the dog's walking, the dog is poked in the booty. They keep walking along, the drug is inserted. The dog never knows what happens. So if we're going to need to sedate these animals, we need to get good at actually um, getting them sedated in a way that doesn't involve rabies, poles, and other not five on your um, survey rating approved. So I'm like a rattlesnake fast, get it done as fast as you can. Um, some of the clippers and all can you be noisy. Hospital environments can be very noisy. So let's you know, put the ear plugs in, put the cotton balls in. They do make a lot of really quiet clipper blades these days. You can also put a towel over their head and ears to help muffle the sounds. And don't forget, you know, you can put a catheter in the back leg just as easily as you can in the front leg and then use some of those soothing background sounds. We're gonna um, pre-medicate, sedate, pre-optionate. Um, this is an air muscle and this is a cat getting pre-optionated. And then ideally we're always going to want to use injectable drugs because any board certified anesthesiologist is going to tell you that you need to capture that airway as fast as you can. And we're not going to do that in the induction chamber and we're not going to do that um, with a mask. So. We quite often can get these, cat, these cats and dogs with catheters if we can find a way to sedate, sedate them. And the fear-free programming teaches you that if you can get these cats in a soft-sided carrier, they talk about pre-medicating them, giving an injection right through the soft-sided carrier. Um, there's a V-gel posted here too with different ways you can access your airway. And also, you know, this shouldn't need to be said, but it does. When we're going to get these animals at deeper levels of sedation, we need to remember that if they can't sit up, if they can't control their airway, and remember some of these brachycephalics can suffocate on their own tissues, we need to monitor them by trained personnel with you know, blood pressure, EKGs, pulse oximeters, carbon dioxide, and the like. Uh, Post-operative nursing care, you know, a word about shivering, Hypothermic humans said that it post-operative hypothermia was uncomfortable and less tolerable than surgical pain. Like, what? I said, what is happening here? And so animals can't talk, but I'm going to assume that if it's uncomfortable for us, it's uncomfortable for them. Take a look underneath those stainless steel gurneys, and you'll probably see these ice crystals. Um, and I do want to make sure that you guys know that we need to cover at least 60% of the body surface to do effective rewarming. So that means that all of those little hot water bottles, you can put them all in a big pile and blow them all up because they're not gonna be good. You're gonna need to use convection or something else. Um, and there's a dog with those 60% of its body surface, maybe 90% looks so comfortable. Okay, other good things we can do after surgery for these guys, express their bladder you know nobody wants to wake up from surgery themselves having to go to the bathroom and some of these animals they're trained to go outside the soft clean bedding from home is good here 
And let's remember to cluster these, these treatments, right? Honor those circadian rhythms. So we're not gonna do a temperature at one, a pulse at two, a respiration at three, a pill at four, and a walk at five, but try to cluster them. And so these animals can get their rest. Soothing music can help. There are a through a dog's ear, eye calm units. You know, apparently all animals like the sound of dogs, uh, like the sound of reggae. Many pet owners probably like the music they hear at home. So this all can help get fives on our survey. And this is not a character from Dr. Seuss, but in fact, this is a dog. And what if this dog was having a TPLO and it's already gonna have trouble getting around? So we can groom here and trim these feet up so this animal can still get around. And remember, we're going to be updating our emotional medical records all along. We're gonna be labeling, labeling these animals. What do they like while they're in the hospital? Do they prefer men or versus women? You know, do they like, um, you know, chicken versus beef? Pheromones are going to be so important here in the post-operative period because they can help encourage nutrition. And so you might have to pet these animals and hand feed them, tender loving nursing care, which is what we all are good at as technicians. Hand feeding them, that plate right there was actually a meal somebody made at my practice. I almost ate it myself, it looked so tasty. Um, but we buy rotisserie chicken from Costco and we break that stuff up and they love it. And then some dogs will like um, some of those um, honey on their food versus cats that aren't as big of a fan of that. Cats like smelly foods as well. So we're gonna get them to eat so they can go home. Um, but one thing we're not going to do anymore is we're not, not, not going to force feed these animals anymore because this is also associated with fear, anxiety, and stress. And so if these animals need ongoing nutritional support, we're going to do PEG tubes or esophagostomy tubes or nasogastric tubes or the tube du jour, however you want to do it, but do not force feed animals anymore. It can cause food aversions, and you're not gonna get fives on your survey, trust me, you're not gonna do it, so don't do that. Um, going through this, I wanna make sure that you guys know that muzzles are okay. You know, when an animal with a great deal of fear, anxiety, and stress comes into my practice, they will wear these muzzles throughout their hospital stay. But what you don't notice much here anymore is we don't use the nylon muzzles anymore. We're using basket muzzles that the animals can be fed through, be medicated through, drink water through, pant around, and they're a lot more comfortable. And so when it's time to go home, you know, we're certainly going to give those owners the rundown on the treatments. We're going to demonstrate those. We're going to back up our verbal instructions with written instructions. My facility, we have a TPLO video that owners can go to and for 20 minutes learn everything they need to do to care for their dog at home after surgery. And then we're going to remember when these animals get home, how can we reintegrate them with the family, right? So we might have to use, you know, feel aways and adaptals and keep pets separated and use those anxiolytics. Again, trazodone, hand out like candy. Everybody gets a 100 count bottle. And then call these people after surgery. And so. These are some posters. I think these are from Sophia Yin. Differentiating pain from fear, anxiety, and stress is crucial to reading the subtle signs of body language. And so we're going to spend the rest of our time just learning to do that. And so some of our cat subtle things are going to be hiding, crouching, looking back and forth. Sometimes, you know, grooming, suddenly grooming can be a sign of low level anxiety in cats. Our dogs, maybe they'll be like hyper vigilant. Uh, they will be moving away from you. They will be yawning. It's a low level anxiety. Panting is very common. And you know, pet owners come in like, he needs a drink of water. You're like, no, he doesn't. He needs some PVPs. Um, so you'll have to educate your clients here too. And the feline grimace scale um, just came out with an app, posted goal. Now, you, you remember that cool cat I was talking about? Look at these uh, cartoons that show you 
What happens when these cats get uncomfortable? So we're looking at, again, very subtle facial changes. Many, many species have these grimace scales, except for, of course, dogs that are so good at mimicking our expressions. But what you're looking at here with cats, the more painful they get, the farther apart their ears go, and the more painful they get, their muzzles go from round to flat, and then their whiskers change shape. So let's look at a couple of animals here while we're finishing up. So here's my dog, Madigan, and I can 100% tell you what's wrong with my dog, Madigan. So you're probably thinking, you know, looking at her body language, her tail's tucked up under there. Yeah, she could be afraid her ears are back, her eyes are dilated. But one of the things that's characteristics for her is look at her back is hunched. And so my dog, Madigan, was in pain. She was in some pretty bad pain. Let's look at this cat. This cat is owned by my dear friend, Kristen Cooley. And this is her cat, R2. And look at R2's face, right? So here you can really see, you know, the, the ear tip distance is going way far away. The eyes are squinted. Many times the head will be very low. And look at the shape of this muzzle. It's very oval. And so R2 had GI lymphoma and R2 was in a great deal of discomfort. So this cat, I would call painful. How about this guy? Um, this guy you probably recommend, uh, recognize from the earlier slide. And this dog, if you look on the floor carefully, you can see there's all kinds of food on the floor. So this dog was seeing our behavior department. What you'll notice is that it's got a, a flat back, not an arched back. You can definitely see the whale eye. You see the tail tucked up right under there. You see a little bit of a pointer thing going on. It's picking up one of its front legs off the floor. Not interested in the food on the floor at all. So if you call this one fear, high five. You got it for sure. Um, and what about this guy? This is our last guy here. Um, you know, this guy, you can look, the ears are definitely back, but in a different way. The muzzle looks very round to me. Now, unlike my cool cat friend, I don't really want to reach my hand in here and pet this cat. Not if I don't want to come out um, with needing a Band-Aid. So I'm going to say this guy here is having a fear. So I hope that you're now getting a little bit used to practicing, you know, recognizing fear, anxiety, and stress from true pain. And I'm going to tell you, where could this end? You know what? The sky's the limit. Literally, any organization, any group, anybody that works with animals in any capacity is going to find value in treating these animals with dignity and respect, getting fives on your survey every day, or at least high fours, right? And bonding your pet owners to your practice. Um, but, but truly so, my big question is, why did this take so long? Why are we just now starting to be respectful of animals' psychological and emotional well-being while under our care? And now my job is done, and I will leave it up to you to go out and try to get fives on your future surveys. And with that, I will go ahead and take your questions. All right, everyone. Uh, thank you for staying with us and watching that wonderful presentation. Thank you, Heidi, for uh, letting us all uh, watch that for the first time. Maybe some people for the second time, but it was lovely. It's always good to spread the love, right? <laughs> someone asked, someone said, who's the person with the horse in the background? And I was like, that's, that's Heidi. <laughs> that's right. Um, okay, so it looks like we got a couple questions here. Um, I'll ask you these while we're waiting. Everyone else, um, if you have any questions um, you'd like to ask Heidi, please put them in the chat or in the Q&A, um, and I can grab those and ask her for you. Um, Heidi, we had a couple questions come in. Um, from Trey, uh, the first one was, have you had any success with temporal or tympanic temps? 
Um, at my facility, for the most part, the only people that use that is the emergency critical care department as far as the ear thermometers. Ear thermometers are supposed to be the most accurate. The caveat is if they're used correctly. Unfortunately, to my knowledge, there isn't a good validated veterinary temporal thermometer for use in animals that is reliable. So unfortunately, we don't really have a good way to do that. Now, what I have heard is some people have those microchips that can read body temperature. And from what I've heard on those, there is some uh, good feedback and bad feedback, depending on the situation that they are sometimes reliable, but I do realize that in some states, you know, you need to document uh, body temperature before administering a vaccine or doing routine health care. So the temporal ones, I'm not uh, convinced that we have a good version of that available for veterinary medicine, but certainly um, people seem to like the ones with the microchip associated with it for uh, some animals. They, they feel it does okay. Awesome. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, the next question, uh, can Zofran be a better option instead of Serenia due to the cost? Oh, that's another good question. It, you know, it, it, at my facility, we pretty much have every department, including the emergency critical care department, trained, whereas if the animal is coming in for surgery or going to be admitted through emergency for a foreign body requiring some antiemetics. Generally speaking, our facility uses a lot of the Serenia or the Meropitans is the generic term. I know the oral version, we often send that home and have the pet owners give that the night before between 6 and 10 p.m. If they're in the hospital, you can do that since the injectable is associated with stinging. Um, my facility, generally speaking, has not done a whole lot with the Zofran other than maybe in the oncology service where they might have chemotherapy associated nausea. But for the most part, we're trying to deal with an opioid induced nausea and also get them eating faster after surgery which is another way to get fives on your survey, by the way, getting them rapid return to eating. And I think because of that combined benefit with it having studies showing that it helped prevent nausea or vomiting associated with um, ACE, promazine, hydro, pre-med, and that we want these animals to get eating faster, I think is part of the biggest reason we've embraced the Meropitans over the Zofran. But certainly a good question. And if you don't have Meropitans readily available, I don't see a reason why you couldn't go ahead and use that for sure. Great question. Okay, um, I actually have a, there's a follow-up to that. Um, Michelle says, I was taught that Serenia is a true anti-emetic where Zofran is an anti-nausea. Uh, do you feel Serenia can really help? At my, at my facility, we do. And, you know, I, I have done some consulting work for Zoetis, and they really don't want to specifically saying the word nausea because we can't pull the animal and say, are you nauseous today? They can't answer. They're not verbal like infants and elderly people with dementia and that kind of thing. So we're going on large part on an assumption when we see that they're pursing their lips, they're drooling these long drool things, you try to offer them food, they're turning it away kind of thing, then we can certainly assume that that's what's happening, even though we can't necessarily prove that. And so at, at, at my facility, we, we just use so much more of the Serenia or the Meropitans on a, on a routine basis. I, I, I'm afraid I don't have a good answer or, or experience with that to comment, uh, particularly one way or the other. Thank you, Heidi. Um, let me see here. Um, we had a question here about uh, fear-free ways that you can have owners pre-medicate their cats. Do you have had any tips or anything you could share that you've given people? Yeah, for sure. So ideally, if you can either do a transdermal preparations, that's going to help improve the relationship with the pet owner and the cat, because the last thing you want is for you to become the evil pilling person. And as soon as the cat sees you, they hide and you're not going to find them for days. 
And so we really have to find ways to make this palatable for them. So in transdermal preparations are great. Many medications can be compounded in a transdermal situation where you can like alternate ear flaps, the inner ear area doesn't have a lot of hair. Um, sometimes you can get them to eat it in food. Now my own personal cat, uh, Duran Duran, he had to have heart medication all the time. And he loves, I, I put a, the pill in a little dab of like margarine. And he loved this stuff. And every day he'd be down, meow, 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 like he wanted this butter so bad. So that was a way I found to food motivate my cat. Uh, my other cat, Clarice, she would take medication mixed in like ranch salad dressing. But the good news is the veterinary community is well aware of the difficulty pet owners have with medicating cats. And there is a new product on the market, a transdermal buprenorphine that is good for post-operative pain for up to four days. And that is really gonna be great news because most of our analgesics, even NSAIDs are more designed for osteoarthritis pain and chronic pain conditions. And we don't have a lot available for us specifically for acute pain. And so that's going to be a great one as well. I believe it's called Zorbium. Um, it's brand new on the market. And then of course, on Zior, if you listen to the sales reps, Robena Coxib, the cats are supposed to gobble that stuff up like candy. Um, I don't think every cat does, but certainly if you try a medication and you have another option that the cat might, may find more palatable, like uh, the meloxicam, which can be used in the United States for three days, other countries use it for longer than that. And as long as you're monitoring, you know, renal values regularly and you have some follow-up with the veterinarian with some of these long-term NSAIDs, they have been successfully used, but with the careful, careful supervision of the veterinary team to make sure they're tolerating that okay. Awesome, thank you. Um, we'll ask a few more here. Um, how long does the Elma cream need to be on before an IDC is placed for optimum efficacy? Yeah, so I, I, you know, I, technically speaking, they say at, at least a half an hour under an occlusive bandage. I'm going to say leave it on for as long as you can, but you know, I think the literature says 30 to 45 minutes. So if you can get it on there and get them, I like to call it marinating and let it taking effect. The more time you can give them, the better. Now I have had some of my colleagues say they only do that Emla cream for about 20 minutes or so, but my official answer is it does require longer than that. And if you can give it as much time as possible, now, some dogs will, or cats will freak out from clipping. You know, ideally you'd want to clip the hair, apply the emlet cream, but you can even just wedge it in between the hair follicles if the animal is really offended by the sound of the clippers or the clippers coming towards them. Then you can just work it into the hair coat. And, and remember, a back limb is just as fair game as a forelimb, so some animals will tolerate you working around their back end better while you keep your, you know, um, churros going for the kitties, or if you have some frozen chicken broth or something for the dogs to work on while you're working. Um, anything like that you can do is certainly beneficial. We have one more question here, um, or an additional, excuse me. Um, so that kind of ties into that one. Um, we had someone ask that uh, standing behind an animal with FAS can make it worse sometimes. Um, so yeah. wondering uh, if it's sometimes not a good idea to be behind a dog or something like that, do you change your tactics if that's the case? So the sedation ninja is a great method to sedate some of these dogs that are really questionable. And the sedation ninja, I can't remember if I put that in this presentation or not, but it's basically you get a syringe attached to a long section of tubing and a little um, needle on the end. And then somebody walks the dog down the hallway while the ninja 
is following close behind. And when the dog is distracted with all the different sights and being walked, you know, somebody just pops them in the booty with the needle, you fire your syringe in real fast, and it is done literally in seconds. And that is a great video if you have a lot of attendees and I didn't include that in this presentation, I'm happy to forward that to you to share with everyone because okay. that is a really sweet technique that is uh, completely fear-free. The animal doesn't even know that they were um, given any drug and the dog keeps walking down the hall like nothing happened. So if I didn't include that in here, as I, I know I have longer versions of this, it's really valuable and it can be a game changer. In the past, we used, we, we used to do you know, undesirable things where we'd kind of try to squeeze in between some cage bars and they knew what was happening and they were having a great deal of fear, anxiety and stress. And this sedation ninja, we've done this uh, many times and it, it's a game changer as far as trying to sneak up on them, if you will. <laughs> Uh, that was wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Heidi. Uh, we just hit time here. So I uh, really appreciate you um, coming in and, and, and hopping on and giving us some live Q&A at the end here. Um, it's been my pleasure. It's a really important topic. And I'm so happy to see so many people getting on board or maybe just improving some of their practices for their facility to, to take it even that much further.